Hello and welcome to Fuel Poverty Action's series of monthly learning sessions. Fuel for Thought, from Fuel Poverty to Climate Justice. Uh, for those of you who are new to this space, Fuel Poverty Action is a grassroots organization which campaigns to protect people from fuel poverty and climate disaster. And Fuel for Thought is our space to share research and lived experience, tackle lies and clear up confusion on fuel poverty and climate change as we ask and answer questions with experts, activists and campaigners. The session we've prepared for you today is uh, called Robbing the Poor on in-work fuel poverty, energy debt, disability and um, the experience of fuel poverty of pensioners. Um, where we'll also be discussing how the government actively undermines our ability to live warm and what we can do instead to keep other, each other safe. The main issues we're discussing tonight, in work fuel poverty, fuel poverty and experienced by disabled people and pensioners and energy debt are political choices. Government inaction means that we're still spending double what we did two years ago on energy bills. Uh, these prices cost lives last winter and will continue to do so again unless we take urgent steps to address injustices. Moreover, the present system punishes people for being poor. People are turning off everything in their homes but still facing unaffordable standing charges causing debt to accumulate. A little statistic for you, over 5 million households are in energy debt and are now threatened with the possibility of companies breaking into homes to forcibly fit prepayment meters, as we saw happen en masse last winter. All the while, we've seen record profits among, among energy and fossil fuel companies. First, Our first speaker tonight is uh, Alex Considine, who um, is, dash was, an organizer for Don't Pay UK and uh, Extinct Extinction Rebellion. Uh, Alex is here to talk about her experience of in work fuel poverty and organizing to support herself and others facing unaffordable energy bills. Alex, the space is yours. Uh -oh. uh, thank you very much. Um, lovely to see some old faces and some new ones here today. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alex, otherwise known as Alex C, because apparently there's about 100 different Alexes in these climate spaces. So, so I go by the name of Alex C. So I'll just briefly go back two years of what happened when the energy prices went up. So I think it was, was it April, maybe 22, when they started talking about the increase of energy prices. So I decided I was going to cancel my direct debits just on my own free will, just thought I've just cancelled the direct debits and I'll go back to paying as I used to pay, you know, just with a check in the post or going to the post office or something like that. As soon as I did that, my energy supply started getting very shirty with me and started threatening me with if you don't start paying monthly or if you don't do this, you don't do that, they're going to increase the prices. Also, they kept uh, trying to force a, um, uh, a smart meter on me which I didn't really want to take because I just didn't trust it so that was about April and then in the summer I ended up going to France and hanging out with some French friends who just really kind of opened my eyes to how ridiculous the system here is in England when they were laughing at me going I can't believe your energy prices are going to be 75 percent dearer and we over here are going to be four percent more and that kind of really just made me go what are we doing how are they having it so cheap and we are still paying so much more? By the time I got back from France, I'd noticed that there was this little campaign up and running called Don't Pay UK. So obviously I thought that campaign was just made for me and joined with that and started becoming an organiser with that. That campaign tried really hard to get a million people to not pay their energy bills. And we did. We did get really, really far. Um, and... We didn't realise it, but there was probably already over three million people not really paying, not because of the campaign, but just because they couldn't pay. Um, the campaign kind of went really well, but what happened from that, we, all of us, all us organisers and people who organised it, ended up incurring quite a lot of debt. 
which you've had to like pay off slowly, slowly. My energy supply has changed about five times since 2022. Um, I've had five or six different energy supplies that I haven't asked for myself. They just keep changing. So every couple of months, somebody's, I've got a new supplier. I think I was originally on uh, Southern and then I was on a Mark Suspensers and then I was on an Ovo and then I was on this. And it just kept changing without my knowledge. And I had no control over who my supplier is now. It also went from paying quarterly to now pay monthly, which I never agreed to do either. And where my bills were quite cheap before paying quarterly, they're now triple what they were paying monthly. So it's a real big shock to me how I have to pay for this and also pay off some of the debt that I incurred from not paying as well. So it's been a real struggle. Now, personally, what's happened with trying to cut back on heating is the building I live in has prone to mold and damp and nearly every apartment who's cut back on their electricity and their heating have got serious mold and damp issues now so it's a catch-22 it's a real burden for us here we're trying to save money but saving money at our own health risks so last year four of our neighbors and myself had pneumonia for three months We've had two children who've been hospitalised and we've had quite a lot of sickness in the building and it's got worse in the last year. I mean, it was pretty bad before, but it's got a lot worse. And when I talk to my neighbours, a lot of them are not putting on the heating. And so we're wondering if this is why it's getting worse in our building. Cold, damp homes, everybody's getting really, really sick. So it's been really, really tricky situation. And I, I came back from Barcelona only two days ago to find mold and damp rising up around the back of my bed and over the windows and things like that as well, which has only just happened in the last like two months. So that's been really quite um, hard to deal with. Going back to campaigning, one of the things I kind of really liked about the Don't Pay campaign was it was just very, very small and grew really, really quickly. And a lot of people kind of got on board with it um, and working with Extinction Rebellion what I found was climate activists are really really good at shouting and trying to like bring down the energy moguls like stopping oil stopping this and stopping shell but they weren't actually willing to stop paying their bills which I kind of found really kind of odd so you know we'd be out with Extinction Rebellion or Fossil Free London shouting outside shell building to you know, it's not fair. But then when you ask them about paying their bills, they were still willing to pay their bills on time, which I thought was a bit weird. I still don't pay my bills on time. So I'm never going to pay my bills on time. I'm always going to be a little bit late. And I still don't pay by direct debit because I just don't think it's right that they should be able to take the money out of my account whenever they want to. Um, I prefer to go to the post office and pay with pennies and pences as much as I can do. Just do my thing. Well, I send a check every now and again, post data check. So I'm still kind of disrupting the system as much as I can, as well as I can, and probably paying off just a little bit of debt each time I do pay a bill. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my story of Don't Pay UK and Extension Rebellion. And one of the reasons I really, really love working with Fuel Poverty Action because it's just such a small, lovely little group that, as I said before, it's one of the only campaign groups that actually gives me hope because you're actually we're actually doing something that could actually work. You know, if we change this energy system and we created a universal tariff or whatever we try to do, it could actually work as opposed to let's bring down all oil and gas, which is so far in the future. So. My heart really lies with this Fuel Poverty Action. I think it's a great campaign. I really support it and I will carry on supporting it as much as I can. So that's me. Hope that was enough. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much, Alex. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, next, uh, we're going to be hearing from Ellen. Um, Ellen is a pensioner activist and campaigner for dignity, respect, financial security, recognition and social justice for all. Ellen is Vice President of the National Pensions Convention, Chairperson of the Ethnic Minority Working Party, Chair of the Lambeth Pensioners Action Group, uh, also a member of the How of, uh, Housing London and Women's Working Party, 
a member of Greater London Forum for Older People and a long-standing member of Fuel Poverty Action. Uh, Alan is going to talk about the link between pensioner and fuel pensioner and fuel poverty, and their impact on um, the health, welfare, and quality of life of older people, as well as the government's response to the many challenges confronting older and disabled people and the urgent changes that are needed. Alan. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. No yes. problem. Yeah, I'm going to be speaking about the link between pensioner and fuel poverty. And I'm not wearing my NPC hat right now. I'm wearing my hat, my pensioner hat. I'm wearing my pensioner hat because I am a pensioner and I share the pensioner's challenges which are happening at the present time. Now, when we retire, and I had that experience, I retired over 20 years ago. And when we retire, we look forward not just for as a hope to do better, to live better, to live healthier, to live longer, and to actually sit back on retirement and look at ourselves with pride, and the pride being what we've achieved in our working days. Now, that is a hope. It should have been a promise completed. But on the contrary, for some of us, it's not what is happening, has happened, and will happen to future pensioners, and that's we've always got to think of the pensioners of tomorrow. Some of you are going to be those very people. On the contrary, I said, things are not happening and coming our way. There's a huge divide in life experiences of the aging population in terms of their, some of us living shorter lives, others living our lives in more bad health, many of us experiencing the worst quality of life in retirement. The inequalities are stark, and I'm going to be quoting figures to show what I mean by stark. The older people, and especially Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, Older people experience some of the most upsetting and the greatest inequalities across service areas. And what we need to recognize whenever we plan policies, programs, support services, we've got to take into account that pensioners are not an homogenous group. We differ. We differ in culture, we differ in race, ethnicity, disability, and also family structures. And sometimes it seems as if when we put in place policies or programs and we think about the pensioners, we think about everybody is the same and we're not. We are different as I've just said. And that's why it is important for all of us whether we are old, whether we are young, to look to that part of what we are doing uh, uh, in you know, our demos, our petitions, whatever it is that we are doing. Now, I'm going to come back now to pensioners. I became a pensioner over 25 years ago. So I've lived that long life. I've had some of the challenges, especially displayed by other pensioners. And the facts are, and just before I came and uh, joined, there was a statistics was published by the uh, NFU Poverty Coalition. And I actually had to change the numbers because I said that 2.1 million pensioners are living in poverty. 
And I also said that things will get worse over the decades with about 40% of people, older people in England who are current, currently over 50 and almost 20% of us are over 80. And why did I have to change that number? Because it's now put at 3 million older people living in poverty. That was an eye opener. With regard to our pensions, our state pension is one of the lowest in the developed world. The pensions go up every year in line with inflation or wage growth. And it's called, that's called the triple lock. In April this year, the pensions are going to go up again. This year, a bit more than in the past, it's going to go up by 8.5%, 8. 8 which means that all of us will get that 8.5%. We don't all have the starting same starting point. Some of us are just starting. Some of us have been pensioners for a very long time. Now, an 8.5% increase is good. Yes, it's good, but how good is it when the cost of living and other structural inequalities are going to diminish that amount that we think is going to change things around for us? And what are these inequalities? You know it, but I'm going to repeat them. The fact that some of us are on low pay or have been on low pay. Some of us have been on part-time work. Many pensioners have not been able to save. And some of us have not bought into private pensions, pensions, neither in wet place pensions. What about our prospects for employment? What about the discrimination and the ageism which takes place when we apply for jobs? What about the discrimination by age and other uh, areas? Homes that we live in. How many older people aren't right now wrapping themselves in blankets with little hats on their heads to keep warm? It's a fact. Indecent homes is a fact. What about mental health? When you can't afford to pay your bills, to heat your home, to eat properly, to participate in activities that you would like, your mental health is going to be affected. Recently, I've, we read that the um, government proposes to raise the pensioner age to 71. Just imagine, I retired at 65. Some of you, if we don't challenge it and change it, are going to be retiring at 71. Now, we in the National Pensioners Convention, because uh, LAMPAC is affiliated to the National Pension Convention, we are campaigning for a pension at the rate of 70% of the living wage and above the official poverty level. The official poverty level at the moment is 242.55 pounds per week. And of course, again, campaigning for social justice and decent pensions for all. I've deliberately separated these two to give us a picture of what our lives are like as pensioners, because those figures that I've given, those uh, uh, statements that I've made, tells you about the link between pensioner and fuel poverty. It's about income. It's about the ability to pay. It's about the quality of life after many, many years of service, not only to ourselves, to our communities, and to our families. And we all, and we do not dispute the fact that the challenges with regard to fuel poverty are linked 
to living in cold, damp, energy inefficient homes. Also, as I said, the inability to pay, to pay to heat ourselves, to pay to put in repairs, pay to have uh, heating, as well as in summer to keep cool. It's not just a one way. In summer, some of us can't keep cool because we haven't got that facility. Now, fuel poverty, and we all agree on this, we all know that it's that condition where um, people are, sorry, sorry, it's, um, it's a condition whereby, uh, I can't read my own handwriting, whereby households are unable to heat or cool their homes. And also, it is that which will in, will advantage us. Oh, I'm getting confused on this one. I shouldn't be. But anyhow, we know what fuel poverty it is, the inability to pay our bills, to keep warm, to keep safe, to keep out of actions which will endem be endemic on our lives, especially on our health. Now, what has happened so far with regard to our inability to pay our bills, to keep warm, and to thrive? Again, I'm going to map out a set of statistics. 10% of the incoming household's income is insufficient to maintain an adequate standard of living. Now, these are the facts. And why am I giving you facts? Because we've got to get a full picture. And it's going to be, again, if you want me to send you the statistics, I will. The first thing, 4.1 million older people are estimated to be affected or were affected in 2023. The average number of deaths caused by cold weather, that's an average, I'm going to read it out, 7,459 people died as a result of cold-related illnesses. Almost half of low-income households still live in energy inefficient homes. Bear with me, please. 1.8 carers live in energy inefficient homes. 5.9 low income and financially vulnerable households are in fuel poverty. 3.5 million people live with a disability. That is also important. And many older people start when they retire, already have certain disabilities, health and otherwise. Over 8 million adults if this is prediction, over 8 million adults will experience fuel poverty to 20, from 223 to 224. Again, because of the state of their homes. Now, what has been the impact? Again, first of all, it's the health implications. It's the impact on the National Health Service as well, which says that 2.5 billion a year is spent on health issues relating to older people and others. What are the health issues? A range, a lot. I've got on my list the risk of coronary heart disease. I've got increased risk of death, as I've already mentioned. We've got mental health issues when we are, cannot think of how to raise the funds to heat our homes, to eat properly, and also to participate in social activities. I'm not going to say much more than this disabled people, because I think we've got a speaker on that. But I am going to say 
that the cost of living is, and especially the special equipment that uh, dis disabled people need to keep going and sometimes also to keep warm, the amount of energy they spend in the home when it is winter to keep warm because they are housebound and also, of course, the other factors pertaining to their mental health, as I've already uh, spoken to you about the uh, conditions. Right. Now, all these statistics, all these facts, the big thing is it's not happening in a vacuum. All this is happening as energy com companies are making eye-watering profits on the backs of older people and people, not only older people. Energy prices are rising and pushing more people into poverty. What about the injustices of the pricing system? Standing order charges where people who pay more use, use less, pay more. Forced entry to install prepayment meters. Some of the problems of heating and pricing are also some things that we need to take into account about our rural homes. We live in cities, most of us, but what about those people who live in rural uh, uh, um, parts of the country? And as a member and as part of the Fuel Poverty Action, Energy for All, Fuel Poverty, an end to fuel poverty. This is what we, as pensioners, are saying as well, that fundamental change needs to happen, especially in the pricing system. We need an end to fossil fuel subsidies. We need a windfall tax on energy companies who are raking in eye-watering fortunes, as I call them. We need pensioner justice and an end to the injustice of people having to spend their retirement in atrocious conditions. And in fact, lastly of all, we need to promote and achieve energy for all. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ellen. Really fantastic to hear you speak. Up next, we have uh, Paula Peters who is the, uh, a disability rights activist uh, for people for disabled people against cuts, uh, who, will, who will be speaking to how disabled people have fought, won, and build solidarity across movements. Thank you, Amal, and to everyone at Fuel Poverty Action. Um, good evening, everybody. So I'm Paula Peters. And I'm on the National Steering Group of Disabled People Against Cuts, or you all know us better as DPAC for short. And I'm also a Unite um, Community activist. For first shout, shout out for um, the fight against fuel poverty and cost of living crisis. Um, there's a day of action coming up on the 6th of March, which is the day of the budget, um, organised by... Um, Unite Community, National Pensioners Convention and Fuel Poverty Action, um, titled Cold Homes Kill, um, Increase Incomes, you know, Lower Bills. So if you're in London on the 6th, when Jeremy Hunt will be speaking about half 12 that day, um, come down to College Green, um, make some really um, massive banners, some effective ones, because the world's media is going to be down there talking about the budget. And obviously, you've heard today that the government um, announced that the UK has gone into recession as well, supposedly, um, with all the money that's going around that the government are creaming off. Um, but we need big numbers out there on the 6th or find out where a local action is across the country and join that. And that's make this campaign really effective to, you know, um, jump into a summer of activity going forwards. Um, to start with, you know, um, 
there's 16 million disabled people in the UK today. And 48% of disabled people with that number are in fuel poverty. We've got 4 million disabled people in abject poverty today. One in six homes have a disabled person living in it in, in horrendous poverty. And disabled people have higher costs because of their disability, they're high energy users. We are hearing horrendous stories of disabled people across the country who are rationing their energy, who can't, who are using, who are having to turn off fridges where they're keeping insulin um, cold for diabetes because they can't afford to switch it on, switch it on. Um, rationing ventilators, charging mobility scooters, wheelchairs, uh, peg feeding, and it's having a detrimental impact on disabled people's lives. Factor into that, um, we have 100,000 people in uh, England in um, social care debt, um, chased by local authorities for money they haven't got, being sent bailiff letters, um, threatening letters. And then you have the situation with energy companies, many disabled people are on prepayment meters. And you've seen recently that Ofgem have given EDF Energy, Octopus and Scottish Power permission to um, forcibly install prepayment meters into people's homes. And you've seen this winter alone that 2 million, um, two million uh, people who use prepayment meters have had to have run out of energy and are in the dark. And it's so important we get that message out there, the detrimental impact on that, especially going forwards, but every day, but the 6th of March on the day of the budget, we stand there and say cold homes are killing, that these energy companies are making extortionate profits at the expense of people's lives. Now, going back to uh, DPAC, how disabled people have fought and won. Disabled people, well, we work with Fuel Poverty Action, we work with the National Pensioners Convention, we fight against all of the cuts. This is cuts to libraries, cuts in healthcare, cuts in social care, cuts to social security. Also disabled people are workers. So it's important at the impact that the cuts are having on disabled um, workers. But we're, I'm gonna start with a campaign that we were very effective with. And I'm gonna throw some things out there. How many of you have smart meters in your property right now? Any of you? Okay, I'm going to give you um, some information you might want to use for campaigning. Um, the smart meter system, the technology, is owned by Atos. They actually own they actually own the software globally, which is called World Grid. So they own the smart work smart meter system in every country worldwide. They own it. They own the technology. And it's called World Grid. Start researching what World Grid is and how much money the energy um, atos are making in the companies. How many of you have EDF as your energy supplier? Any one of you? Atos own it. Atos own EDF Energy. How many of you have Vodafone contracts for your phone? Atos own Vodafone. Santander? Any one of you have a Atos own it? At us own, any of you do online banking? At us own, the online banking system called, um, it is called, uh, it's another company, World Grid. It's online, yeah, it's an online banking system, but they own it globally. They're in 36 countries worldwide, and they have over 25 billion pounds of government contracts here in the UK. Passport control, the GP desktop contract in, the, um, in your GP surgery, Atos. When you've been to physio, you see the Atos sticker on the laptop. They're seeing all your notes, seeing all the, all the things that you're, they literally control every area of your lives. Literally, they see everything you're doing, literally. When we, um, in 2010, when the government um, decided with the emergency budget and they cut 28 billion off the welfare, um, of the welfare state and they said they were going to um, reassess everyone on incapacity benefit to employment and support allowance. Now ATOS um, were already in the um, disability assessments contract 
they came in in the middle 1990s under a Labour government and started with the personal capability assessment before it became the work capability assessment. And ATOS um, were going to carry out these assessments. We started to hear in, in 2009 that disabled people um, were being found fit for work, some of the earliest new claims, and were dying as a result of these horrendous outcomes of assessments. And we, when DPAC formed on the 3rd of October 2010, we decided one of the first campaigns we were going to launch was against the Work Capability Assessment and Atos Healthcare. And one of the things we've been very effective at is literally researching the company, who they're involved with, as I just pointed out to you, some of the companies they've been involved with, following the money, but also trashing their reputation. We were outside assessment centres talking to disabled people who'd had assessments. We were then literally following what was happening, going way back over 30 years to the attacks on the, on the welfare state. And in the, in the US, ATOS are known as UNAM, which are part of the private health um, insurance system, the disability deniers. They deny that disability exists. You can be cured from your... Uh, disability and and this is what's been happening and so we had this hashtag we're very prolific users of social media to shame companies and also MPs ministers we find their accounts and we literally come up with snappy hashtags and we target them and we used this hashtag called Atos Kills we had a badge we used their logo had Atos Kill in, in red underneath it they threatened to sue us within six months so we continued to use it to hit them back. And then we found out that they were going to sponsor the um, Paralympic Games in uh, London. So we decided, and when they had their, um, their, so that we decided, right, we're going to have our own Atos Games. So we had a week of action coinciding with the Paralympics. And on the first day, we had our own Atos Games where we gave out gold medals to people being found fit for work. Then we had, um, a action outside Atos HQ, which is based in Warren Street. We found out exactly where their um, HQ was. And we had a thing called the Atos Miracle Tent where people would go through and would be cured of their disabilities and everything. And we shut Atos down. Now, disabled people have a very long and proud history of using direct action as a campaign tool. And we take the fight to um, Parliament and also to the companies who are involved in these um, government contracts and it rattles them when you're at their front door and you're outside they get scared when you go in Parliament and you face down MPs it terrifies them we went to select committees where um, the Minister of the Secretary of State for DWP at the uh, time Ian Duncan Smith was we sat there and every time we looked around we held a piece of paper up you murder her on it, put it down, and he was flustered. People watching on TV thinking, what's he keep doing that with? Because we had we were literally behind him. We went to his house on the day the bedroom tax was uh, introduced, and we occupied the grounds of his house with pop-up tents and had a picnic in his garden, put an eviction notice on his door, and we kept putting the video footage out there. He's in a 10-bedroom um, mansion while people were being taxed for having a second bedroom in there you know and uh being put into arrears because of it but what we did with the power we got the paralympians on side who were starting to be hit with um assessments themselves by they had atos on the uh, vanguards and during the closing ceremony when we were outside they hid their vanguards and were actually disciplined for doing so in solidarity with us that was the first day that we occupied the Department of Work and Pensions and we shut that building down. But we didn't sneak out round the back. We went out the front door to the world's media on our terms and we told them, this is what they are involved in. And Ian Duncan Smith and Maria Miller, as we used to call her Killer Miller, the, the Secretary of State for Disabled People at the time, were actually smuggled out with blankets. That was also one of the first times disabled people face state violence, where one of our members had their shoulder fractured on a protest, where some of our members were tipped out of wheelchairs. And what the police do now 
is they report disabled people to the police when they see us on protests, as fracking campaigners did have, have had that happen in Lancashire. But what we did was we drove the share price down at Atos, and we also made it very difficult for Atos to recruit assessors, which is why they're having huge problems now. When we found Maximus were going to take over the work capability assessment, we re researched everything about them and we titled them Maximus. So we had bare bums and we totally turned around the name of their company and we drove their share prices down by 30% within 12 months. They too are having recruitment pro problems. When we spoke, when we were on NHS picket lines, we spoke to nurses, doctors, paramedics, and we told them, do not work for any disability assessor, no matter how much money they throw at you, they will ruin your rep reputation and they will not, that you will not be recruited in any other company. It's as simple as that. But what we were very effective at as well, I think um, in 2016, when they had the mayor elections on, and Zach Goldsmith was standing for election. We found out that he voted for the Employment and Support Allowance Work-Related Activity Group cuts. So we had a name and shame campaign and we put it out there on Twitter what he was involved in. Use the mail hashtag, name and shame, and we shamed him on Twitter. This is what he's voted for and this is what's hurt disabled people. But we also got him off the board of Richmond, um, the Deaf and Disabled People's Organisation in Richmond. They forced him out um, because of the campaign that we waged. We also found he was going to be at a photo shoot with George Osborne. We crashed that photo shoot so the photo couldn't take place. But we also made people aware what he was involved in and he didn't win that election. And that was a name and shame campaign that we had on Twitter. Ian Duncan Smith's expenses, when we found out he claimed for laundry of his underpants, a nine pound cocktail, a 39 pound breakfast. We had a line of underpants outside the DWP, outside his place of work, outside the hustings in um, 2015, and literally embarrassed him to the point he didn't turn up to a hustings. And we used the election, like. Um, to literally get disabled people registered to vote, to take part in hustings. But also we went to where we heard Esther McVeigh was um, standing in the, in the Wirral. We went to the Wirral, linked in with um, Liverpool Against the Cuts and many campaigners, dressed up as Esther McVeigh, went round the Wirral, stuck in sack Esther McVeigh stickers and all of her placards, had a huge march in central Liverpool and we got her out of her seat. That is what campaigning can achieve. But we also had to learn the law to challenge the law. We had to learn about the work capability assessment. We had to learn how to do, um, fill out forms for personal independence payments, research the sanctions, how to help people get justice. If we get justice for one person, we've done our job as a campaigner. If we force a government U-turn, we've done our job as a campaigner. And DPAC were instrumental in bringing the formal complaint against the government using the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. Four years of work went into that complaint. The government had the embarrassment of being the first state in the world to be formally investigated under the conventions of the rights of disabled people the first state in the world to be found guilty of grave and systemic human rights violations towards disabled people, the first state to be found guilty of catastrophic impact the cuts have had on disabled people's lives. The government have blood on its hands. In March, we'll be back in Geneva where the minister has been ordered to, to attend and we will be there facing them down. But make no mistake about it, worse is coming down the track. You've seen the white, health, the white health and work disability paper that they've just launched last year. We're gonna need the solidarity to push this government back because what they're planning is absolutely dangerous and it's gonna cost thousands of lives. On Sunday, the 18th of February, 
DPAC have an online Zoom meeting. You can check the website. It's called the Disability Benefits Shake-Up, what's planned and what's at stake. And it's from 3 to 5 p.m. Please come along and support this important meeting. And then on Monday, we'll be co-hosting a meeting with John McDonnell about the disability assessments and what campaigning ideas we can have going forwards. But one thing disabled people have always said to Deepak is this, and to other disability campaigners, what we give them is hope that when we continue to fight, we force the narratives, we change the narratives and we keep campaigning, we keep people going that they, that they too um, can see that we can make a difference. Campaigning does make a difference. It changes lives, it changes communities, and you can force change into parliament. And we were said to once, the change doesn't happen in parliament. Change happens on our street corners, in our communities, in our towns, in our villages, and in our cities. When we support our neighbors to get justice, our friends and our families, you make a difference. And that's exactly what DPAC does. We work with trade unionists, we work with library workers, we work with nurses, we work with doctors, because disabled people have been denied healthcare. They've been denied access to libraries because the local library is shut, which means they can't access the support because everything's online. And over a third of disabled people in this country have no access to a computer and do not know how to use one. Over 5 million older people have no access to a computer and do not know how to use one. So what is important and what we always knew from the get-go was the word solidarity. But solidarity is not a word. It's what you do. It's what you do to help your neighbour. It's what you do to help fuel poverty action. It's what you do when you stand outside British Gas and demand the CEO do something about lowering bills. But also what it's about, the solidarity, is when you build a movement and you see that movement on the streets and you're shutting streets down and you're all together under one collective voice, that's how you change minds, that's how you change hearts, and that's how you make things a better place. Thank you all for having me today, Solidarity. Fantastic, Paula, thank you so much. Um, if you have any links uh, for the events that you spoke about, um, please put them in the chat, that'd be great. And last but not least, uh, we have Stephanie Martin speaking next. Uh, Stephanie is an organizer with Unison, and the Morning Star Women Readers and Supporters Group, um, which is a group based in Scotland. Thanks. Um, honestly, I just want to start off with saying that I was nearly moved to tears there with what you were saying, Paula. I've got such warmth in my heart for discussions on that level of direct action and militant campaign, and I'm here for it. Um, so thank you for that contribution and thank you to everybody who's made a fantastic contribution tonight. It's tough acts to follow, honestly. Um, and thank you to Feel Poverty Action for inviting me to be part of this. I feel truly honoured to be part of this really important discussion. Um, so the sort of topic that I'd like to briefly introduce um, is the particular experience of women in austerity as it relates to Feel Poverty in particular um, and to also just demonstrate a little bit about how trade union activism is one of the primary channels that we can address this through. Um, and just quickly to introduce myself, I'm Stephanie and I'm um, on the organising committee of the Morning Star Women's Readers and Supporters Group in Scotland. Um, and for those who don't know, I've never heard of the Morning Star. Um, it's a daily newspaper, a socialist daily newspaper and the only socialist daily newspaper in the whole of Europe that's written in English. Um, and it's been a staple of class solidarity in Britain since the early 20th century. Um, right up to the present day. So I used to work as a community links practitioner um, in the social care sector where I was issuing fuel vouchers on a regular basis and um, really working with people on, on the front lines of challenging poverty and with that sort of first aid method. Um, and now I work for Unison um, as a full-time local organiser for social care workers. Um, and at the same time, I'm also a single mum of a three-year-old, um, which, as other mothers will agree, is my real full-time job. Um, so I just want to start off with a kind of brief underpinning analysis of how we in the Monastar Women's Reading Supporters Group view women's relationship to capitalist society, because that obviously dictates our relationship to austerity as well. 
Um, so it kind of it starts off with women's reproductive role in society, which goes beyond childbearing, and it's typically the woman's responsibility to do the child rearing, the majority of housekeeping, housework, meal preparation, etc. Everything that essentially uh, re reproduces and replenishes the workforce and society is typically down to women. Um, that's both historically and currently the case. Um, for instance, on average, a woman would carry out, I know a lot of you will think it's a lot more, but on average, it's 20 hours of unpaid domestic labour per week on top of any additional employment or anything that she has. And the responsibilities that women bear has also led to our dominance in certain sectors of employment, which are traditionally regarded as women's work. So that's childcare, social care, nursing, hospitality, administerial work, cleaning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that division of labour in itself isn't necessarily oppressive to women, but the treatment of those sort of feminised industries by capitalist society, the society that we live in, is oppressive because these industries are seen as unprofitable and therefore they're chronically underpaid and undervalued. And then on top of that. Um, the additional commitments that many women have, um, caring and childcare responsibilities, also act to limit their capacity to work full-time hours. And that can often lead to women taking up a disproportionate level of precarious employment, where hours are unpredictable or ad hoc, terms and conditions are poor, uh, with low levels of sick pay. And sometimes these workers actually have no annual leave entitlements either, which leaves their pockets obviously vulnerable anytime they need to take time off. Um, and the Poverty in Scotland report from last year demonstrated how women, disabled people and minority, minority ethnic people in particular are in the eye of a storm of persistent low pay, unreliable and insufficient hours, which means that they struggle to make ends meet. 72% of those in Scotland that are locked in low pay are women. Um, and in the In Work Poverty report in Scotland indicated that the top five lowest paid industries are predominantly run by women. Um, women also disproportionately experience in work poverty due to those reasons that I mentioned, the childcare responsibilities, the additional costs that come with that, um, and the, the treatment of those sort of women's work type of industries. Um, and in the social care sector, where I worked for the majority of my working life, um, in which I'm now organising with Unison, women are making up 80% of the workforce, and over half of all bank or sessional contracts are taken up by women. Um, Obviously, over the course of the past few years, energy prices have gone up through the roof. At the same time as wages have actually gone down in real terms, the cost of childcare, the cost of care has also gone up. But those price increases aren't even being seen in the pay packets of the workers who occupy those sectors. Um, when I worked in social care as a links worker issuing fuel vouchers, the majority of the recipients in my experience that I gave fuel vouchers to were women with caring responsibilities either to children or to people with disabilities, um, and many of them had disabilities themselves. And as Ellen quite rightly mentioned as well, another massive issue that I dealt with was dampness and mould in the house, um, which was being neglected by social landlords as well as private landlords, um, and people were actually being advised to turn their heating on to deal with mould and dampness, and obviously they weren't being given any additional support financially for that. Um, I also read as well on the Fuel Poverty Library that women are found to be more at risk um, than men if they if they have children, if they're a lone parent or if they are disabled. So there's a real sort of crossover between different conditions for people here where people are being made extremely vulnerable due to those sort of caring responsibilities that they have um, and their relationship to disability, whether that's having a disability yourself or caring for someone that does. Um, and so as part of my role now as a full-time union officer, the issue of fuel poverty is one that we we survey our members on it as we conduct pay surveys ahead in negotiations um, in April each year on people's pay and conditions. And that data that we collect on our members' experiences of fuel poverty, you know, if they've ever had to go to a heat bank, if they've ever had to receive a fuel voucher, if they've ever applied for grants or taken out loans to pay for their bills, that information directly links to our bargaining table when we're fighting with employers to increase the pay and conditions that will eventually alleviate that experience. Um, and then furthermore, Unison also have a There For You grant, it's called, which releases funds twice a year, I think it is, um, to members that need it um, to help them afford energy bills. Um, but 
as I'm sure the other speakers tonight and everyone else will agree, those sorts of um, grants and fuel uh, vouchers, the first aid responses to ameliorate conditions of poverty are short term and they're really not enough. We do need to organise that wholesale fight back, like what DPAC has been doing, um, against that perpetual ca casualisation and disappreciation of these feminised workforces, because it's that itself that's causing the conditions of poverty that are forcing people to need to use these sorts of services or plunging them into debt and all sorts of other consequences. Um, so we need to see women workers paid to that dignified level where grants and vouchers are no longer needed. And the only place that this can actually be achieved is through the trade unions. Um, this was demonstrated in Glasgow and in other local authority areas across Scotland, where Unison and other unions uh, put tens of thousands of pounds directly into the pockets of the lowest paid workers um, in, the set, in, the set, um, in the city. So that was our home carers, cleaners, support for learning workers and other education staff, predominantly women workers, who for decades were receiving less than their male counterparts employed in similar roles. So, if, for example, um, janitors and groundskeepers being paid more than cleaners um, for doing broadly similar work. And through the grassroots organising and campaigning of those members, those women um, in our city, we saw the biggest equal pay strike action um, for decades in Glasgow. We had tens of thousands of women out on the street on industrial action, um, and they managed to achieve tens of thousands of pounds into their own pockets as a result of that. Um, so just to move lastly onto the work I'm doing just now within social care, um, as people from elsewhere in Britain will be aware, there's a push here for a national care service that would see a standardisation across the social care sector of um, pay terms and conditions, as well as the standard of care, delivery of care that we should expect in a modern society. Um, but in Scotland, the context is slightly different in that we already have a National Care Service Bill in place that's now moving to its um, second phase, um, but it doesn't go anywhere near far enough. So the campaigning aspects are still required. Um, and what we need to see in order to address the chronic poverty that our carers are experiencing, as well as those they care for, is uh, what we would call sectoral bargaining, where the union sits with the Scottish government determining bargaining over the terms and conditions and the rates of pay that every single worker receives, regardless of who the employer is in the sector, whether that's a private care provider, local authority or third sector. And it won't be until we are able to achieve that level of big campaigning and big bargaining that we'll be able to deliver the mass difference and change that we need to see. Um, and obviously, I, I believe that the, the strongest way for us to be able to do that as a trade union is to link in with those allies that we already have, like DPAC and other community campaigning groups that are made up of and work with disabled people and their families, service users of the social care sector, to bring them closer together with the workers in the sector so that we're all singing one unified voice and a progressive voice for change. Um, and that just brings me lastly on to the work that the Women's Readers and Supporters Group has been doing recently. Um, over the course of the next few months, we're going to be running a series of webinars um, on the topic of women in austerity. The first one was on women in precarious workforces. Um, so we had speakers on from social care, hospitality and education um, talking about the work that their trade union is doing. Strategic um, campaigning ideas were shared um, and it's really building that solidarity across different sectors for workers that are broadly experiencing the same things. Um, and then the next event we're going to be running is on maternity services, and that'll be looking at women that work and that women that use the services, as well as those who work in the services, um, and the, the sort of degradation of that through this period of austerity that we've all suffered. And then the last session will be looking at um, women and pension poverty, because as we know, women disproportionately experience that as well. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. I'm going to put a couple of things in the chat if anybody wants to find out more about the Women's Readers and Supporters Group, that would be great. Um, and I'll certainly be alone to anything that you guys are doing as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Stephanie. Uh, great to have you with us and uh, great to hear from everyone, everyone else who's uh, contributed so far as well. And now it's time to hand over to everyone else in the session. Um, for your reflections, stories, questions, and comments. Um, 
to our speakers or just to anyone who's here. If you'd like to come in to say something, uh, please raise your virtual hand. Um, you should be able to see an icon at the bottom called reactions um, where you can raise your hand there. I am also going to uh, unmute everyone so you can come in. Um, so you can also raise a hand on your screen and I'll bring you in. That also works actually. Yes, I see a hand from Holly. Hiya. Um, amazing speakers today. Thank you, everyone. I, I think it's so important to really drive home the point of all these intersections that are truly affected at the heart of fuel poverty. Uh, I, I fit into a lot of those groups myself. And it's comforting yet not all at the same time to know I'm not alone in this, that I'm not the only one like thinking I want to go out, but I can't afford it. I can't afford to charge my mobility scooter. So that means I'm more physically isolated, that I'm always rationing everything. Like nothing switched on apart from like my fridge freezer. If I'm not actively using it and I'll cut everything down. I, I put the heating on like a handful of times. Like I had it on all day at Christmas for a treat. Like the fact that having heating on and being warm is a treat now. My boiler's switched off at the wall because I'm washing and like just washing my hands in, in cold water because uh, it's so ridiculous. Uh, I can't afford everything. I used to be able to just about make ends meet living on just my disability benefits. Because, I, you know, as much as I'd like to work, my body won't allow me to do that. I'm kind of stuck in this position. And ever since, like, 2020, in the cost of living crisis, or as, you know, we say in Unite, the cost of greed crisis, because that's what it is. Like, first it's like, okay, what can I cut down? Then it's like, Suddenly I've got to pay for my social care. I don't understand why before I didn't have to pay and now I do. And my council for some reason just didn't charge me for ages and then hit me with a gigantic bill backdated for a year, literally just before Christmas. And I've got to somehow magic this money out of nowhere and nothing. And... It's like, well, I've not been assessed for this properly. And you're you're telling me that my rent's only £45 a week. It's not that. It's loads more than that. And you've not taken into account, like, disability-related expenses. And the fact that I've now had to, like, try and read every guide possible to try and navigate the system, to try and chip off as much as I can from this gigantic bill. I think that's why, like, Paul is right. It's so important that we do have to, like, educate ourselves on, like, getting through these disability assessments and helping each other out. Um, through Unite Community, I've been very privileged to be able to be put through via the union paying different courses, and I've been able to support other people and support other union members because of this. And again, Paula is right. Even just one win makes a huge difference. The difference between that person who came to me freaked out and scared and terrified and me going, okay, let's do this. And saying like beforehand, trying to prepare them, like they will try and knock as many points off you as possible because they do. We're in a system where assessors are incentivized monetarily to make sure that you cannot claim or you get the smallest claim possible. 
this system is literally built against us. And so many people don't even realize, like, I, I live alone. I don't want to live alone. I want to live with my partner. But I can't do that because if I live with my partner, I'll lose my ESA. Because if you are a disabled person and you are living with someone who isn't disabled, they somehow have to then have a job that pays well enough to support both of you. And so many people who aren't in that situation and don't know anyone who's disabled don't realize these things. So I effectively have to live alone. Like I would like to get married, but I can't afford to, not just because the cost of the wedding, but because of the cost of living with someone and being married to someone would mean that I would lose essentially one of the things that are keeping me alive. It is just absolutely disgraceful. I deserve to live a dignified life. And as things stand, I've not been able to do that. And it is awful. The isolation and the psychological effects that it can have on you. Like literally a shower is a treat. Because I like uh, as a, I'm very independent, and even though I do have support, I don't really want to have someone helping me wash in the shower very much. You know, I will if it's really, really necessary, but I prefer to try and do things myself, and that takes time. Like I, in the shower, I am over an hour. It's always over an hour, and I can't afford to spend over an hour in the shower every day or every other day so now I am going longer and longer periods of time not even being able to have like a proper wash because it's too expensive I used to have long hair I've cut it off like I got short hair now because a huge chunk of that time in the shower was taking for me to wash my hair and it's like it's too expensive it's too expensive for me to have long hair so I cut my hair short because it's just another thing. Literally, what can I cut? And that time, it was my hair. Like, looking around my home, what else can I sell? It is just... Without things like Fuel Poverty Action and DPAC and the NPC, we are isolated. And isolation, it, it is death. This system is built to take us out. I have a lot to give. I'm an intelligent, driven, I think good person. I deserve to be in the world. And I am not going to let this awful system this awful government that puts constant barriers in my way to live a dignified, happy life in comparison to like an able-bodied person. I'm not going to let that grind me down. And through things like Fuel Poverty Action and Unite Community, like I've found that solidarity. Because again, solidarity is a verb. It's something you do. It's not just something you say. And we need to take action. And we need to support each other because each other's all that we have. Uh, I think I could go on for ages, so I won't. But thanks for letting me speak. Thank you very much for coming in, Ollie. Would anyone else like to come in to share uh, their, their story, their story, their experience, um, or have a question for one of our speakers? Mary, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm new to this campaign, so forgive me if I'm saying things that uh, that aren't relevant, but. Um, Welcome. Uh, one of the one of the problems is that um, 
different local authorities have different provisions and different policies i think there's you know there's a lack of uniformity um uh, where where i live uh, which is in north london uh, there's um there's an organization called better better.org.uk and i was referred to them by the doctor and um they have um if if you're over 65 I think it's 65 it might might be less um you can you can have free free swimming sessions before 12 o'clock you have to book but the thing about the swimming session is um it's the shower afterwards so uh, it's not just a free swimming session it's a free shower and um I I, w I wash in the basin every day but that is my one shower and uh, I wash my hair with it. I've got long hair and um, I tie it back, but it's very long. It's down to my waist. Um, and um, so that's a useful thing. Um, other, uh, some community centers have these warm spaces uh, and it's, it's like a social event. Uh, you can go to the community center and it's warm into a warm room and um they they've um uh, i don't know how many of them are still well that was for the winter what what will happen i don't know um but um these are these are workarounds you know that individual uh um organizations are doing but i'm i'm involved with my local labor party branch and what i'm trying to figure out is how much of these issues can be can we uh, uh, get into how can we interest the Labour Party in tackling some of these issues? And I know that Keir Starmer uh, keeps retracting, um, you know, lowering expectations. Um, my my um, my MP is Jeremy Corbyn, by the way, and he got chucked out for being too left wing. They they. They they made up some story about anti-Semitism, but basically he was too left wing, um, and uh, um, it, uh, the the local politics, you know, the politics of the Labour Party trying to get anything through the system is very very complicated because they've got all these layers of authority. But how much of of what you're talking about can be framed in Labour Party policy? Any ideas? Would someone like to come in to respond to Mary? Yep, Stephanie. Thank you. Yeah, um, so obviously slightly different because in Scotland we've got the Scottish Parliament that takes to do with devolved matters, but one of the tactics that we've been using in order to increase the pay of social care workers is doing like that sort of mass letters to the MSPs um, explaining the issues. And it's like you can you can use online systems that make it they're quite easy to use actually, and you kind of write the template later for people, and they just need to put in their postcode, and it'll come up whatever MSP or MP um is their local rep, and then it would automatically send that template later to them unless you wanted to make any edits. It can be quite an effective strategy for local issues, um. But I I think in terms of bringing this in into policy towards the Labour Party. I'd look at maybe some of the motions that the TUC have on these issues. Um, that's the, the Trade Union Congress. Um, that That's an amalgamation of all the different perspectives. All the trade unions put motions in place that then gets collectively agreed at a, at a conference and democratically decided on. And obviously the Labour Party has links with trade unions. So we would be, you could ask the, the Labour Party to adopt specific motions as party policy that the trade unions have already collectively agreed should be taken up. Um, that's just two suggested strategies to try and get the Labour Party to move um, more closely in line with what needs to be done. Thank you for that, Stephanie. Did someone else want to come in to um, respond to Mary's question? Yeah, Lee? Oh. Lee, I'm sorry, we can't hear you unless you are you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. No, still not, I'm afraid. Is it okay if I 
if I pass it on and I'll bring you back in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Paula, did you want to come in on that? Just quickly. Um, sadly, the Labour Party have abolished the equality uh, officer post on the executive committees at CLPs, um, which is an absolutely um, tra <laughs> horrendous move, but also in their national policy uh, document, they don't mention disabled people within it at all. Um, our attitude with this, um, to be honest with you, the use of language they're using, um, what they're saying coming out, um, coming out of them recently, is there's a very fine line between the Labour and the Tories, sadly. Um, what we say to you is, um, the national, uh, the deaf and disabled people's organisations, the national DPO have a um, manifesto list of pledges. Get a copy of that, and at hustings, take that document um, and start telling the Labour candidates what you're doing on um, the list of demands disabled people need. Contact the National Pensioners Convention and do the same thing. Contact Fuel Poverty Action, and with the, um, you know the fuel for all uh, uh, manifesto and take it to Labour Party um, candidates and saying what you're doing about this on energy, what you're doing about this on disabled people's issues, on older people's issues and start hitting them and saying, you've got elections coming up, let's start hitting them. Um, to be honest with you, um, we're seeing an awful lot of people in the disabled people's movement. Um, we're damned if who we vote for. We won't vote Tory, that's for sure. But with Labour at the moment, the way they're talking, it's more of the same and that worries us dreadfully. And I think the issue we have also um, is voter ID. Um, my borough was one of the first to trial that and um, a few years ago. And since they've bought in voter ID, over 15,000 people have been denied the right to vote. Um, I don't know how many of you do postal votes or vote by proxy, but they brought in last October, you need a national insurance number now on um, on your paperwork and the DWP will check on the database if you're in if, if you're in the database to continue with your vote. And if you're not, you need voter ID. Voter ID um, impacts on disabled people because um, we don't have driving license and passports on older people and low income workers. So, yeah, I would, I would take, we've got to take the fight to the Labour Party. But at the moment, the language that Keir Starmer is using is incredibly worrying. And so is Rachel Reeves, because she's already said she's going to continue with Austerity 2.0. And that's her exact words. And um, West Treating's already reneged on um, abolishing care charges and is going to continue with them. So um, for you, I feel sorry for you in the Labour Party because you've got one heck of an uphill battle, sadly. I wish you luck with it. Thank you for that, Mary. Uh, I've just noticed that people have started dropping off. So I just want to draw attention to a few links that I posted in the chat. Um, so yeah, take a look at that before you go. It has the uh, Fuel Poverty Actions actions of the month, a link to the next, if you want to sign up to the next session already, and also um, a link to our uh, the fuel for thought um, feedback form. Um, Lee, is your microphone back on? No, no, still not. Okay, all right, Ruth, would you like to come in? Yes, just a quickie, really, because Paul has basically said it. Uh, it is really a shame, but I think we're going to end up fighting the. Labour Party, just like we're fighting the present government uh, and for the same things. Um, Paula also mentioned the manifesto, and I hope people, anybody here who's in an organisation, if your organisation hasn't yet signed the Energy for All manifesto, which is designed to make sure that everybody has the basics that they need to keep warm, keep the lights on, keep the fridge going, you know, keep our uh, disability aids uh, charged and so on. Uh, th th that is urgent to make sure that we get as much as we can. We have over 250 organizations signed already and there's more coming in, uh, but it really needs people here helping to, to get that around. And <laughs> to, this has been a fantastic session tonight and I think we need much more. Maybe we might decide to warm up in a nice warm public building when it's cold and hold our speak outs there. That's a really, really good place to help 
press for what we need and has been successful. And we've had victories there against forced prepayment meters and other things. So I think the way of the future is the kind of direct action uh, that Paul has outlined and also you know, carrying on with pressing the Labour Party and the other politicians uh, all together because they're much of a muchness, sadly. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Mary, would you like to say something briefly before I close the session? Uh, yes. Um, a friend of mine has, has a council flat um, and uh, he's partnered up with someone and his council flat is is a tremendous asset because the rent is cheaper but but um he he stays he stays with his friend most of the time and then goes back to his place sometimes he's got di um di different thing things going on in different parts of london so um i don't think you need to tell them if you're staying overnight somewhere that's what i'm saying <laughs> thank you very much mary thank you <laughs> Uh, it's been uh, it's been mentioned a few times, um, but yeah, at Fuel Poverty Action, we are continuously campaigning for every household to have enough energy to cover their needs, including uh, heating, lighting, cooking, and access to medical or mobility aids through our Energy for All campaign. Uh, and yeah, you can take action on Fuel Poverty, including um, signing up to the manifesto and um, just making more noise about it through our actions of the month, which is linked in the chat now. Um, yeah, what can I say? Uh, fantastic discussion. Thank you very much for everyone for, for coming. Um, I hope to see uh, as many of you at the next. And yeah, again, just please let us know how we're doing at Fuel for Thought on that feedback form. It'd be fantastic uh, for everyone to unmute themselves and put their cameras on. If you can, um, say goodbye. Uh, wave goodbye and uh, I will end the session. Bye. Lovely to see Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Good luck, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.